Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. In this edition of our podcast, we remember a loyal American who our government considered a traitor for more than 30 years and who millions of Americans perhaps wrongly still do. She was an American trapped in Japan during World War II who was tasked with demoralizing American forces over the airwaves. But she ended up doing just the opposite. On any given day in 1944 or 1945, American troops were stationed on any number of far-flung island bases in the Pacific. They were soldiers, sailors, marines, and airmen hailing from any number of towns and cities across our nation. Before the war, many from different parts of the country perhaps had little in common, but they found a common purpose in defeating the Japanese empire that attacked our nation. And they had one more thing that united them. Each evening, they all ran to their radio sets and tuned in to Radio Tokyo to hear the voice of an American woman living in Japan whom they called Tokyo Rose. The familiar voice of Tokyo Rose became a staple of life for troops in the Pacific. American GIs would regularly tune in to her show. Called The Zero Hour and produced by Radio Tokyo, these programs mixed popular American music with messages from Japanese propagandists, hoping to make their American military audience long for the comforts of home and abandon the fight. When the war ended and American occupation forces began rounding up war criminals and traitors, no prize was greater than finding Tokyo Rose. Unknown to prosecutors, though, Tokyo Rose was not one woman, but in fact more than a dozen who were conscripted into recording zero-hour programs. Popular imagination commanded, though, that one woman was Tokyo Rose, and the public wanted her caught. Faced with this pressure, and with a number of legal hurdles, authorities settled with naming and prosecuting one Tokyo Rose. But despite public opinion, this Tokyo Rose was not a traitor, but a loyal American through and through. Her story of tragedy and sacrifice is largely unknown even to this day. And today, we share the true story of Iva Toguri, the woman who was misidentified as Tokyo Rose. Iva Taguri was born in Los Angeles, California, on July 4, 1916, the daughter of Japanese immigrants. She was raised fully American. She went to public school near her home, was a Girl Scout, and enjoyed sports, hiking, and swing music. She was popular at school and was considered by all to be a patriotic American. Taguri went to college at the University of California, Los Angeles, and graduated in 1940 with a degree in zoology. She continued in postgraduate studies at UCLA until June of that year, when she took up work at her father's shop. In July of 1941, Taguri traveled to Japan to visit a sick relative. As tensions rose between the U.S. and Japan, Iva decided to return home. In August, Taguri applied for a U.S. passport at the American Embassy in Japan, hoping to get home as soon as possible. Her application was sent to the State Department in Washington and was still there four months later when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. With America and Japan now at war, Iva Taguri was trapped in Japan. Living with her Japanese relatives, Taguri was quickly contacted by the Japanese secret police. Initially, Japanese authorities demanded Taguri renounce her American citizenship. She refused. And because of her refusal, her neighbors treated her with suspicion. Whenever she went outside her home, she received looks of scorn from everyone around her. Taguri, wishing to spare her family from the trouble and humiliation caused by her presence, moved from the family home to a new place in Yokohama. Faced with the reality of having to survive alone inside wartime Japan, Taguri began looking for work. She enrolled in a Japanese language school and began searching for jobs after completing her coursework. Because of her English language skills, she was quickly able to find work with Japanese news companies. She first landed a job at Domei News Agency, working there from mid-1942 to late 1943. It was then that she took a new job at Radio Tokyo as a typist. In 
At that time, Radio Tokyo had just begun broadcasting the Zero Hour, Japan's latest attempt to convince American soldiers to give up fighting. The Zero Hour was produced under duress by a group of Allied prisoners of war. While working as a typist, Taguri helped out the POW producers by smuggling food and medical supplies to them. It was through her humanitarian work that the head of the Zero Hour, Australian POW Major Charles Cousins, first met Taguri. He had been a broadcaster before the war and was captured by the Japanese at the fall of Singapore. He and his two fellow POWs, American Captain Wallace Ince and Filipino Lieutenant Norman Reyes, who were both captured in the Philippines, wrote, directed, and produced the Zero Hour under duress by the Japanese. While they were forced to produce the show, all three men were committed to making the Zero Hour worth as little propaganda as possible. When Major Cousins heard Taguri's character voice, he knew it would be a perfect fit for the style of the show. In November of 1943, she was officially recruited for the show using the pseudonym Orphan Annie on air. Until then, this is Orphan Annie, your number one enemy reminding you GI, always to be good. Bye now. The Zero Hour ran from 6 o'clock to 7.15 p.m. Tokyo time every day except Sunday and consisted of many segments hosted by different personalities. The program played popular American songs such as Speak to Me of Love, in a little gypsy tea room, and Love's Old Sweet Song, interspersed with messages from the boss, namely Japanese propagandists. Taguri never spoke any propaganda. The messages from the boss were usually given to the POW producers either in Japanese or in poorly written English, and the producers would do the best job they could to make the messages, which were supposed to be scary, sound almost comedic. Taguri refused to lend her voice to these messages from the boss, so one of her POW producers would read off the propaganda instead. The Zero Hour became immensely popular with U.S. troops, and although none of the hosts were introduced as such, G.I.s labeled Taguri collectively as Tokyo Rose. Iva's segments averaged around 20 minutes in length. The Army noted later that the show contained little propaganda value. Taguri reportedly was paid 150 yen per month, or about 7 U.S. dollars. In her capacity as a disc jockey, her segment was called Music for You. She continued to help American servicemen, this time over the airwaves, as her broadcasts and the songs she played actually boosted U.S. morale. Also in late 1944, she reported American ship losses in the Battle of Leyte Gulf in one of her broadcasts although this was never proven later in court. However, this report and this allegation would come back to haunt her. Iva and the team behind the Zero Hour continued to produce episodes daily until the war ended. By this time, Orphan Annie and Tokyo Rose had become staples of the war in the Pacific. When the war ended, American occupation authorities began rounding up war criminals and American expatriates for trial of particular interest to prosecutors was finding the now infamous Tokyo Rose. Authorities located a number of the hosts, but many had already renounced their U.S. citizenship and therefore could not be accused or tried for treason. Journalists Harry T. Brundage and Clark Lee offered $2,000 to anyone who had been a host of Zero Hour who was willing to talk, and Iva Taguri, hoping to use the money to get back home, came forward. After being interviewed, she was arrested by occupation forces on September 5, 1945, three days after Japan's official surrender. Because she had refused to renounce her citizenship, she was still subject to U.S. law throughout her time at Radio Tokyo, and that allowed prosecutors to investigate Iva for treason. During the investigation, which was conducted jointly by the occupation authorities under General MacArthur, and the FBI, authorities made Taguri replicate one of her broadcasts on film in order to get a sense of what it was like behind the scenes at zero hour. Well, how are all my darling little dopes tonight? Full of beer and belligerent? I know, you still hate us, but don't let that hate keep festering. It poisons the whole system. What you need is some good dive. I mean solid. Helps you relax. All set? Okay. Here's the first blow at your morale. Kay Kaiser swinging and singing. Hey, Pop, 
I don't want to go to work. Please do with me. Taguri was imprisoned for more than a year before charges of treason were dropped due to lack of evidence. She was released in October of 1946. Her American and Australian POW producers adamantly told authorities she had committed no wrongdoing. She also never received the money for her interview from Brundage, as he had instead tried to sell it to authorities as her confession. After her release, Taguri began trying to find a way to get back to the United States by any means. Taguri was pregnant at the time by her Japanese-Portuguese husband, whom she had married in Japan during the war. She requested permission to return to the U.S. so that her child could be born on American soil. Walter Winchell, the influential American gossip columnist, heard about Taguri's attempts to return to the United States and was horrified at the prospect of someone he saw as a traitor being allowed back into the U.S. He successfully lobbied against her return, and Iva was forced to give birth in Japan. Her child sadly died thereafter. Not long after her child's passing, Taguri was once again arrested by American occupation authorities. It was only now that she returned to America, in handcuffs. She landed in San Francisco, California on September 25, 1948, seven years after her ill-fated trip to Japan. She was then charged with treason for, quote, adhering to and giving aid and comfort to the imperial government of Japan during World War II. Iva's trial began on July 5, 1949, a day after her 33rd birthday. Prosecutors accused her of eight counts of treason, with most related to the false charge of her revealing the position of American ships and troops on air. The trial took place inside the Federal District Court in San Francisco and would become the longest and costliest trial in American history at the time. Iva Taguri's defense team was led by Wayne Mortimer Collins, who had previously made a name for himself, defending the rights of Japanese Americans being sent to internment camps. Collins also brought along attorneys Theodore Tamba and Ernest Bessig. The defense and prosecution teams called many witnesses, including Major Charles Cousins, the producer of Zero Hour. He had been acquitted of treason in 1946 by a court in his home country of Australia. Many who knew Taguri while she was in Japan testified to her innocence. Cousins and the other POWs pointed to her secret deliveries of food and supplies to POWs, which they personally witnessed. Witnesses for the prosecution seemed to give damning evidence against her, however. But even then, prosecutors could tell the mood among the jury members was mixed. One of the prosecutors, Tom DeWolf, stated that, quote, it was necessary for me to practically make a 4th of July speech in order to obtain an indictment. This they did, only by the narrowest of margins, the grand jury convicting Iva Taguri on one count of treason, count six, quote, that on a day during October 1944, the exact date being to the grand jurors unknown, said defendant at Tokyo, Japan, in a broadcasting studio of the Broadcasting Corporation of Japan, did speak into a microphone concerning the loss of ships. Iva Taguri was the seventh person in American history to be convicted of treason, a crime which ordinarily carried the death penalty. But because of the thin margins around the case, she was instead given a $10,000 fine, a 10-year prison sentence, and stripped of her citizenship. After the trial, Iva Taguri was sent to the Federal Reformatory for Women in Alderson, West Virginia. Her attorney, Wayne Collins, lambasted the verdict as guilty without evidence. Many, including some of the prosecutors, knew the conviction was sketchy at best. Another investigation was launched in the hopes of shoring up the evidence, but instead of confirming the conviction, the investigation raised further questions as to the validity of the evidence presented against her the first time. Taguri would ultimately spend six years and two months in prison. She was paroled on January 28, 1956. After being released, she moved to Chicago, Illinois, in the hopes of rebuilding her life. During her years in Chicago, Iva's past as Tokyo Rose slowly began to fade away. But glimmers still remained. 
Chicago Tribune reporter Ron Yates finally picked up on the story in 1976, and his investigation discovered that two of the witnesses for the prosecution, Kenkichi Oki and George Mitsushiho, had perjured themselves in their testimony. Not only that, but they had been forced to do so by U.S. occupation forces in Japan on the threat of being tried for treason themselves. Authorities had coached the men for months before the trial on how to take the stand and what to say in response to questions. With the evidence thus tainted, the justification for Taguri's conviction became weaker and weaker. Further investigations and a feature on 60 Minutes brought Tokyo Rose back into the limelight, this time as the victim of a show trial. As the word of this miscarriage of justice spread, momentum began to build for Taguri to be formally pardoned. In California, Senator Samuel Hayakawa began campaigning for a presidential pardon from then-President Gerald Ford. He was backed up by a vote from the California legislature in support of that pardon. President Ford, who was a World War II veteran of the Pacific Theater, heard the story and sympathized with Taguri. On January 19, 1977, his last full day in office, President Ford formally and unconditionally pardoned Iva Taguri, restoring her citizenship, which had been stripped away upon her conviction. With that citizenship restored, Taguri then tried to bring her husband, whom she had married in Japan during the war, to the United States. He was still repeatedly denied entry, and in 1980, out of options, Iva reluctantly divorced him. Iva Taguri continued living in Chicago after her presidential pardon, and once again faded back into obscurity. She was rarely contacted for interviews despite her incredible and tragic story. In 2005, the directors of the American Veterans Center picked up on the story, and ABC President Jim Roberts thought her story of perseverance and patriotism was worth remembering. On January 15, 2006, at a luncheon near her home in Chicago, Mr. Roberts presented Iva Taguri the Edward J. Herlihy Citizenship Award on behalf of the American Veterans Center. Throughout an ordeal that has lasted for decades, Iva Taguri has en endured her fate with dignity, courage, and a deep faith in God, and in the essential fairness of the American system. This faith has been rewarded, as in recent years there has been a growing effort to right the wrong done to Iva Taguri. The World War II Veterans Committee is proud to be a part of this effort. For her indomitable spirit, her love of country, and the example of courage she has given her fellow Americans, the World War II Veterans Committee proudly bestows the 2005 Edward J. Hurley Citizenship Award on Iva Taguri. Iva later said that, quote, receiving the award was the most memorable event in her life. Never before... Even with her pardon, had she been so honored. I wanted to be positive on this whole thing, and I wanted to be uh, be proud, and I wanted to honor my father and my my family for being supportive, and they and they believed in me. And I wanted I wanted to express my appreciation for the, all the efforts that were given towards this project. Thank you very much. Sadly, she died just eight months later, on September 26, 2006. Iva Taguri was always a proud and loyal American. She was wrongly convicted by our government and suffered because of that for years. But ultimately, that same government set the record straight. And now, history needs to remember Iva Taguri as the patriot she truly was. I'm Greg Corumbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, where at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts.
Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.